Now, turn to section 1. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Hello. What can I do for you today, madam? I'd like to open a children's bank account for my niece. She's just arrived in the States a couple of days ago and will be starting her high school freshman year next week. And you'd like her account to operate jointly with your account, I assume? That's correct. OK, I'll walk you through the process. So first, I need the Guardian's account, which will be yours, of course. Um, what's your name? Julia Thomas. And your bank account number? B W eight four five zero six. All right, I've got your account details here. And about your niece, what's her name? Aubrey Rose. Is that spelled A U B R E Y? No, it's double E at the end. Sorry, she was born in Europe, you see. Okay, and how old is she? She just turned seventeen last month. She really wants to have her own account, but she will not be able to do that until she's 18. At least not in our country, is that right? Yes, it's required by law, unfortunately. Kids can be really reckless when it comes to money management. So, what's her date of birth? Her birthday was about one month ago, so on the 3rd of January. Oh, no, sorry, it's on the 2nd of January. Okay, and finally, I need the permanent address of the child. Is she living with you? Yes, the address is the same as mine, at 12 Northwest Boulevard, Kansas City. Got it. Uh, her debit card will be sent to this address in, I'm guessing, about five to seven days. Now you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now, I have all the necessary information noted down. I'll just have to set up a few things for the account. Firstly, a newly opened children's saving account must have at least $100 as the minimum balance to cover maintenance and any online banking fees. Sure, I always have some cash with me. Here's 100 Great. Next, you have to decide a daily limit for spending and withdrawals. This has to be lower than a regular account so children don't overspend. Our bank's maximum amount is $3,000. How about 2000 I mean, that's still a ridiculous amount of money for a kid to spend in a day, don't you think? Some children could really surprise their parents. We recently had to cancel an unauthorised $5,000 purchase of a car from a 16-year-old kid. Kids these days. Isn't the point of opening up a minor account to teach them about good financial habits? Right. Anyway. We allow our customers to design and customise their cards. Here's a list of our default pictures. Um, let's choose this one with the rainbow. I mean, I like the forest picture, but she'd probably favour something more colourful. Yeah, and if she doesn't like the design, she can always come in and request a new card. Now, we must decide on banking communication method. This is how we'll keep you updated on the transactions that take place with your account. Do you guys have an option for email? We do, and we also have a banking app, but I personally recommend being notified by text message, uh, which are often much faster and much more convenient. Yeah, good idea. I always have my phone handy. Good. We're almost done. There are a few important things that you need to remember though. When you receive the card, come to the nearest ATM and set up a new password. The original password will be in the envelope enclosed with your card. Could you send me a text with the password? Sorry, we don't provide that kind of service. And one last thing. When your niece turns 18, she'll become an adult and therefore the account will be able to be separated from the Guardian's account. But you'll need to come into the bank to set that up. 
Okay, great. Thank you very much. You have some time to check your answers from 1 to 10 of section 1. Now, turn to section 2. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Good afternoon. My name's Cesar Bautisto. Hello, I'm Wendy, one of the welfare officers. Can I help you? Yes, I have to move out of my accommodation in two weeks, and I can't find anywhere else to live. OK, I'll need to know some details about your current situation. I'm an overseas student from the Philippines. The college gave me a temporary room for one month. I can't find anywhere else and I have no money. Have you told the college about your position, or asked them to let you stay longer in your accommodation? No, not yet. I, I didn't think that would be possible. Well, we can contact the accommodation service on your behalf to see if they'll let you stay a little longer, until you can find an alternative. Thank you. But I'm not sure that I can find another place, as they all ask for money before moving in, and I don't have any. Yes, it is usual in this country for landlords to ask for up to a month's rent in advance. Don't you have any money at all? Hardly any. I'm waiting for my grant cheque to be sent from the Philippines at the moment. It should have been here for me to collect when I arrived in Britain, but it seems to have been lost. You can apply for emergency loan from the union if you want. The loan can be for up to £200 and we ask for a post-dated cheque for the same amount to be given to us so that we can recover the money once you receive your grant cheque. That would be very good. I'll apply, but I'm still worried about how to find new accommodation. Now you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. As I said earlier, we can ask the college to extend the time you are allowed to stay in your present accommodation. They may refuse, of course. Then what will happen? If the worst comes to the worst, the union may be able to provide some very short-term emergency accommodation. If you want me to, I'll contact one or two of the addresses on the notice board and arrange for you to visit them. But what if they ask me for the rent in advance? I only have £90 left and I need that for food and books. It'll be all right. By the time they actually need the money, we'll have your emergency loan ready. Just fill in this application form and write me a cheque for £200, please. Payable to the Student Union. Right, I'll do that. Thank you very much for your help. I'm feeling more optimistic now. You have some time to check your answers from 11 to 20 of Section 2. Now, turn to section 3.
First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Congratulations to you both for doing so well the past semester. You too have exhibited an impeccable performance during your first year in the nursing program. I'd like to get some feedback from the two of you to better improve the program and to provide guidance for our prospective students. I'd like to start with you, Helen. So, first of all, which aspect of the program impressed you? Well, to be honest, when I was enrolled into the course, I was expecting a group of classmates my age, but as I stepped into the classroom for the first time, I was surprised by the diversity. Most were in their 20s, but there were also those in the 30s or even 40s. As it turns out, the intergenerational communication has sparked intense debate and new thinking, and I think that's something special about the programme that I appreciate very much. What about you, Paul? What do you think of the programme? For me... The group project we carried out last semester is another key feature of the program. The whole class was divided into eight different groups, working on eight prospective cases. Team building sessions were conducted in a collaborative way most of the time. Comprised of five members, our group studied acute pancreatitis. During the process, we broke the task into different parts and assigned them to each member. We were then able to tackle the complex problem by pooling our knowledge and skills. More importantly, stronger links were established between the group members. Because of the project, we've all become good friends. That's true. According to graduates, group projects prepare them for the work world in which teamwork and collaboration are increasingly the norm. So tell me, Paul, what else do you like about the program? I want to be a registered nurse working in a public hospital after graduation. So the internship provided is a valuable opportunity for clinical practice in a supportive learning atmosphere. However, I was amazed by the amount of written assignments since I thought the course should have focused more on practice-oriented learning. Well, I have to disagree with you, Paul. The essays demonstrate your understanding of the course. For me, writing essays is a process that involves critical thinking, which challenges me to develop my points more thoroughly. I thus manage to gain a diversity of perspectives. The programme is designed to deliver basic and advanced theoretical knowledge of core concepts, including healthcare systems concepts, together with practicum or clinical practice experience to bridge the classroom content to the practice setting. So... I'm afraid written work is unavoidable. Also this year, we've added a module of law. How do you feel about that? At first, we felt that learning law is kind of redundant and too time-consuming. After a few sessions, we realised that it is necessary in dealing with future medical disputes. Now you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Do you have any suggestions for prospective students? What bothers me most is handing in essays on time. I almost missed the deadline once because there were three essays due within the same week. So rationalising your time is critical. Well, that's true. The lectures deliver so much useful information. I have poor memory, so I kept making notes and revisiting them on a regular basis. To my surprise, at the end of the semester, I have learnt the key concepts by heart. How was the research? I heard that it was quite challenging. How did you manage to overcome the difficulties? That's true. The majority of us 
had no clue how to carry out the research at first. Fortunately, when I was digging up reference materials at the library, I sought help from the librarian. She taught me about finding the appropriate resources and choosing the proper research methods. Have you checked out the online forum? Yes, it has become a habit for me to visit the forum regularly. In a sense, it extends classroom learning. It is where the students post academic problems that they come across and get support from the faculty members. Some of my classmates didn't do so well during the placement tests. I feel that background reading is necessary. Lastly, do you have anything to say to the freshmen? I was really ambitious at first, trying to get straight A's on my transcript. I made tons of notes and worked hard, even on the optional assignments, to get extra credit. I stressed myself out before having an emotional breakdown. After consulting my advisor, I found it important to set realistic goals. Don't push yourself too hard. It is wise to sort out your priorities. Thank you for coming here today and providing valuable feedback on the program. Have a great summer break. You have some time to check your answers from twenty-one to thirty of section three. Now turn to section four. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. River dance is an expression of modern Irish culture, but it is based on a culture which had its golden era from the sixth to the ninth century. Before that period, Irish culture was oral and based on a love of complicated stories and poetic styles. But in the sixth century, something wonderful happened: writing was introduced by missionaries. From then on, the culture of Ireland began to develop in ways impossible before. And had considerable influence in Northern Europe in the period up to the ninth century. With the invasions which began in the ninth century, this golden age collapsed, and there never was any real recovery. There were no wealthy kings to sponsor the poets and scholars, so the tradition survived only in a form which the peasants liked. The love of story and song did not die, but no real attempt was made to find a distinctive Irish style. Until the end of the nineteenth century, when Irish nationalism began to influence writers, in English called Anglo-Irish literature, there are many famous writers from that period. There is also William Butler Yeats, George Bernard Shaw, and Samuel Beckett, all of whom have received the Nobel Prize for Literature. In all, Ireland has received the Nobel Literature Prize four times. When you consider. We have only a population half the size of Beijing. You see how unusual that is. Now, let me talk about the music. The Irish love of music has succeeded in surviving the change from Irish, the native language, to the language of the invader, and has once more begun to blossom and become influential outside the country. Irish music was reduced to being the language of the country people, and was dying out as people moved to the cities. Young city people did not want to listen to peasant music, although we were all told it was important. Some efforts were made to make it attractive to city people, but largely without success. More recently, this has begun to change, and since the 1980s, has taken off. But modern Ireland has been looking for more than just a revival of traditional music. Many of the most famous popular singers in the world are Irish. U2, Enya, the Cranberries, and many others. 
there are 10,000 people employed in Ireland in the music industry. River dance is an expression of that new interest in the old and that ability to understand the new. You have some time to check your answers from 31 to 40 of section 4.